So, injection techniques. Alright, first off, before we do anything with these people, we gotta make sure that we're staying as clean as possible, right? So, standard precautions should be used anytime we're messing around with blood, body fluids like secretions, excretion, except for sweat for some reason, the CDC says. I still would wear gloves. Non intact skin, mucous membranes, right? So, standard precautions are what kind of stuff? But what for <laughs> so uh, we're going to use the septic technique, right? That's what I'm looking for. We're going to use clean surfaces. We're going to hand wash before and after doing anything with the patient, and we're going to use appropriate personal protective equipment. So gloves, at least, maybe a gown, maybe a mask, just depending on what the patient has. If they've got TB or something, we probably want a mask, maybe a gown, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and just can prevent spread of disease. For starting a peripheral IV, which we do quite a bit in most departments, um, this is kind of the ideal setup in some ways. We've got, I've got my tape, I can tape the stuff down, tourniquet, alcohol to clean, to prep the skin. Um, then an IV needle, you know, which y'all are probably pretty familiar with. And then I went ahead and included the IV solution, the IV tubing in there. Um, just because I think it's very, very helpful. It can be helpful, um, particularly if you're using it with a syringe, um, to possibly open up the vein. I don't know if you've ever been trying to access a vein, and it's like it gets caught on a, uh, on a, um, valve. a valve. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. And if you just flush a little bit of saline through it, it can kind of open the valve up, or it can help kind of the catheter run up right along the lumen of the vein and kind of and clear that area for, what, for whatever reason it's sticking there. Um, also, IV solution is helpful because it further hydrates our patient, right? So if I, if I hydrate the patient prior to giving them contrast, that's a good thing, you know? Um, and then if, I'm, if there's ever any doubt about whether I hit a vein or somehow maybe hit an artery, an IV bag is really helpful because if I hook the patient up to an IV bag, there's actually going to be backflow up the line and I'll be able to see pulsile kind of movement in the IV bag. Right? You definitely won't, do not want to be injecting contrast through an artery. Right? That would not be a good thing. Um, so that's another reason why the IV solution can be helpful. Um, so in choosing a site, I brought this uh, graphic up here just because it has some nice depictions of, of all these little veins and things in here. Um, so let me see if I can... Yeah, there we go. So primarily what we're looking at, though, is uh, um, this stuff in here, right? Antecubital area, right? Um, and uh, so that means in front of the elbow, basically. Um, if we look real closely at this stuff, though, um, we've got a radial vein that runs right along the, the area of the radius. So if I feel in any general area of the radius, I should be able to find a vein there. Um, and uh, um, also stuff on the back of the hands, right? Um, one of the things I like about this, oh, whoa, my goodness, um, slide <laughs> is that it's radical and does tricks, um, but it's important for us to remember the the left arm. This is actually not my preferred arm for the patient. This is the patient's right arm, and if I look, um, there is a long distance of travel that it has to go up over this area, right, to get over to the heart, right. Um, so. Generally, as a rule of thumb, I go for the left arm, right? Most patients are not left-handed, so they appreciate not having the bruise on their dominant side. Plus, the contrast has, a, it has less distance to travel to get to the heart because it does not have to go across the entire chest to get to the superior vena cava, right? So I know that that's going to track pretty closely with what I know in, in terms of injection timing and stuff like that. Does that make sense? It's not as much a concern for you, but it's helpful for CT. So, um, if they have existing vascular access, um, we can sometimes use that stuff. So, like venous catheters, we can use pick lines now. There's ones that have real distinct kind of purple lumen, purple tubing called a power pick. Um, I think made by a company out of Salt Lake. Those are great, you know, and they seem to be fairly standard. 
um, now. So most picks we can use, we might need to drop the injection rate a little bit. You definitely, before you access any of this kind of stuff, you want the nurse to clear it with some heparinized saline. And then after, prior to doing the injection, I want to push on it and see how well it pushes because some of this stuff doesn't push very well. And you might even talk to the nurse and they'll say, well, use the middle one. And it's like, which one's the middle one, you know? Um, so just double check, make sure you clamp it off after use. And then after giving the contrast, flush a little bit more saline through it. And you need to tell the nurse they need to put some more heparinized saline in it. I can't give the patient heparinized saline. It's like above my pay grade, right? But I can remind the nurse, hey, I use, the, I use this pick line for you know, IV contrast, you know how sticky that stuff is. You might want to put some heparinized saline back in that line so you keep your pick line good, which makes nurses happy and patients too. A tunneled CVC is a fancy name for a port, right? So anytime they've gone in operatively and placed a port in the patient, a lot of what they're using now are these power ports, and they have a distinctive um, triangular shape underneath the patient's skin, and then they have little bumps on them. Have you all encountered those? Yeah, y'all see quite a few cancer folks. So those are great. They're awesome. You, you'll need a nurse to access it with a special kind of needle, right? Again, it's a, <laughs> something, the access for it's above our pay grade. But then they'll flush some saline through it, flush some saline through it both before and after the IV injection. And uh, if you have doubts about any of these kind of access points, don't use them. Just start a peripheral IV. Don't, don't risk it. Um, I've heard horror stories. Um, so there's going to be different phases of tissue enhancement, and that's kind of one of the things that we were looking at on that, that abdomen CT. We could see it in a certain phase, and we would call that phase the bolus phase, because the bolus is actively entering the aorta, right? Remember, we saw the, the contrast in the aorta super bright, right? Um, so that's going to what we would call an arterial or bolus phase, right? So probably anywhere from like... 30 seconds after the beginning of injection to maybe like a minute or so, the patient's going to be in that bolus phase. And so at some point in there, the contrast is going to peak. It's going to get to like a peak kind of bolus phase, and then it's going to start to tail off from there. And what's happening as it's tailing off is it's going into this non-equilibrium phase. So this is where there's like kind of some balance between, uh, or it, there's a kind of a tenuous balance between the contrast in the arteries and the contrast in the veins, Right. This is, this is beginning somewhere around 60 seconds and going to maybe um, a minute and a half, somewhere in there. So a lot of admin studies that we do, we're going to start the injection and start the scan in about 50 to 60 seconds, right? Because um, that's going to get in that non-equilibrium phase, right? Or a venous phase. Another name for that might be the venous phase of contrast. Um, if the contrast is in an equilibrium phase, it's pretty much completely been distributed throughout the entire circulatory system and all the organs of the body, and it's not going to be very apparent that it's contrasted at all. Um, so what, one of the things our textbook points out is that this equilibrium phase is actually almost useless, and it happens pretty quickly after the non-equilibrium phase. Um, <coughs> and, but during this phase, um, the images that we're getting may not, it may have been better just to do a CT scan without contrast um, because we've, we've brought everything up to this kind of equal level of contrast and that's exactly what you don't want with contrast. You want the non-equilibrium. You want to be able to see distinctions and structures, right? That's why we call it contrast. So <clears throat> different kinds of bolus techniques. Strangely enough, we can use a drip infusion. The only time we would do that is if we're doing a CT of someone's brain, right? Because of the brain blood volume kind of thing, that barrier, um, contrast is not going to actually enter the brain for four minutes after. So I can start the patient on a drip infusion of contrast and then start the scan in four minutes and I'll have contrast in the, in the brain, right? Um, that's the one weird, that's the outlier, right? That's the, that's the, that's the exception that proves the rule. Most of the time, we're going to be injecting it, injecting some kind of bolus of contrast. We're not going to be infusing it. We're going to be giving a direct bolus. So we can either do a hand injection or a mechanical injection. Hand injections, the only time I've ever done hand injections were, were on pediatric patients. I got the patient's weight, drew up the amount of contrast that I needed. Typically, you're going to draw it up in two or three syringes just because it's easier to push, but then you have to switch it and then push again, right? Um, 
And you might be out there getting zapped while you're doing it, you know, because this machine may have already started firing, just depending on what you're trying to scan. So that gives the reason for why we like the mechanical injector, our little robot friends in the CT suite, right? Um, the mechanical injector is going to allow me to control the rate at which I'm giving this stuff, and, um, <clears throat> and also I don't have to be getting zapped every time I'm giving someone contrast. But if we're talking about mechanical injectors, we really, really, really need to talk about air embolism. This is scary stuff. Let me get my underlying device working here. Um, but yeah, scary stuff. Why is you not working? Um, seizures, right? Permanent neurological damage and death, right? If we, if we use the mechanical injector... And I've got a hundred and fifty, a hundred, a hundred milliliters of air drawn up in this injector, and I inject a hundred milliliters of air into the person's veins. I'm pretty much going to blow their brains out their ears, right? They will be a vegetable. Okay. So bear in mind, this is a powerful tool that we have, but we have to respect it. Okay. I'm not trying to scare you, but I am. Air embolisms are for real, and um, the, the number one thing that we can do, right, is if we're ever using a mechanical injector, we can kind of use the universal sign of whether or not the injector is ready for injection into a patient, right? So if you can imagine, I'm, I'm gonna, it's going to look like a five-year-old drawing on this thing, but here's my syringe, right, my mechanical syringe. This is terrible. Oh, my goodness. I don't, my stylus is not working. If it's pointed up, <laughs> this, is, this is a scene. Um, I'm putting some lines on it, okay? If it's pointed up, that means do not inject with this thing, okay? If it's, <laughs> if it's pointing down, it means this syringe is ready to inject into a patient, right? So this is good and bad. Now that these images are permanently seared into your mind, okay, maybe we can avoid, maybe we save someone's life by me drawing this. <laughs> so, again, for loading the injector, point it to the ground when it's ready, point it up when it's not ready. All right. Um, contrast characteristics. We're almost done. In terms of the contrast characteristics and how it, kind of perfuses through the patient's body. Um, we need to talk about volume, flow duration, and flow rate. And this is not rocket science. What we're talking about is the amount of contrast that I decided to give this person. So there's going to be some institutional standard for most protocols, right? Generally, it's about 100 milliliters, right? So that's the volume. In addition to that, I need to be thinking about the volume of iodine inside the contrast, right? That's a factor. <laughs> And it's largely decided by whoever the doctors determine they like the way that the 350 looks better versus the 320, right? The 320 uh, mil milligrams of iodine per milliliter, right? And that's generally the range. Three, like sometimes you'll see 250s, but most stuff is going to be 300 or above, right? So volume of iodine inside the volume of contrast that I'm giving them. Then the flow duration. So since I'm injecting this stuff into the person's body, there's going to be an amount of time that elapses as I'm injecting it, right? I need to keep that in the back of my mind. Um, because during that phase in which the injector is still actively um, injecting contrast into the patient, I'm, st I'm always going to be in the bolus phase, right? I'm always in the bolus phase if the injector is injecting. Once I get to like 15, 20 seconds, after that point, the, the contrast has gone through the patient's heart, and for the, after that, after that 20 seconds, I'm pretty much in the bolus phase, right? Once that contrast, once the flow duration cuts off, um, then now we're moving into uh, non-equilibrium and then to equilibrium, right? Then kind of the last consideration in this is just the flow rate. You can program into these things how quickly you want it to inject. Like generally, it's going to be like 2 milliliters per second, to upwards of four, sometimes even six or seven milliliters per second if we're doing a, 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 like a heart study, coronary study. We're going to inject pretty fast on those. So we're going to need a better IV. We're going to need to have like a 18 or 20 gauge IV.
But for most exams, what I, what I can use like a 22 gauge uh, access, and I can then push at like maybe two milliliters per second to three milliliters per second, and that's a perfect kind of flow rate. The nice thing about that is it gives the appropriate kind of duration for most volumes of contrast. So just understand that all this stuff is kind of interrelated, but all we're talking about is how quickly we're giving them the, the, the amount of contrast. Questions? With yeah. The, uh, with the air embolism, do you mean like if we don't prime the tube? Priming the tube would be, would result.